learning target four, we're talking about one-sided limits. Now, a one-sided limit, instead of having to approach a value with sides at the same time, you can approach with one side. Okay? So, if we have a limit from the right, that means we're going to start at a value to the right of that value, and we're going to approach it from that direction. All right, so when it says the x approach is from the right, it means we start at the right. If we want to do a limit from the left, that says x approach is from the left, that means we want to start from the left and approach that value. Okay? So, for our one sided limit, you have a little bit new notation. It says limit as x approaches c, a plus sign means from the right, a minus sign means from the left. Okay? Again, from the right means you start at values greater than that. So you start at the right. And as x approaches from the left, you start at the left of that value. Okay? Now, when the limit from the left is not equal to the limit from the right, the two-sided limit does not exist. We've seen that already in graphs. I can approach from one side and from the other side, and they don't meet up, and so we have a limit that does not exist. So that still happens. But maybe from one side, we can actually get a limit. Okay? All of the properties, theorems, techniques that apply to regular limits apply to one-sided limits. All right? So that means you can look at a graph still. You can make a table still. You can use direct substitution or algebra still. All right? All of those things still work for one-sided limits. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to use the graph to determine the limit. We'll talk about continuity in learning target 5. Now here it says that c equals negative 1. So for a, I'm looking for the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right. For b, I'm looking for the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left. And for C, I'm looking for the limit as X approaches negative 1. Okay, we're using a graph, so I'm going to do C first, because this is what we're familiar with. We've been doing two-sided limits. So if we're doing two-sided limits, I'm approaching negative 1 from both sides. And so if I follow this function from this direction, and this function from this direction, we're approaching two different points. The two-sided limit does not exist because they're not meeting up. So if we're looking at a one-sided limit, though, those can very easily exist even though the two-sided one does not. So let's look at the limit from the right. So as x approaches negative 1 from the right. That means I start to the right of negative 1 and I approach negative 1. Well, from the right, that means I only have to look at this bottom piece of the piecewise function. And it looks like I approach this point right there, which is at negative 1, 0. It doesn't matter what's happening over here because I'm not looking at that direction. I'm only looking from one direction. So this limit equals 0. Now if I'm approaching x from the left, I start at values to the left of negative 1. So that means I'm on this piece of the piecewise, and I'm following that. And I reach this spot. And so even though there's a hole there, again, limits, we're looking at the behavior of the function around that point. So it looks like x approaches, as x approaches negative 1, y approaches 2. The function approaches 2, so the limit is 2. So here we have a one-sided limit that exists, a one-sided limit that exists, and then a two-sided limit that does not exist. And that happens quite frequently. So looking at a graph still applies. Here it says find the limit if it exists, and if it does not exist, explain why. Well, we talked about this. You should always try direct substitution first. If we can directly substitute, then why wouldn't we? So this is what we're looking for, the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the left. So if I substitute negative 3 into my function, So we're going to have a denominator with 0, we know we can't have that, so direct substitution doesn't, doesn't work here. So that's the bad news. 
Maybe you could try algebraic methods then. So do I need to use a conjugate or do I need to factor or something like that? So here I could try to use a radical and I could multiply the numerator and denominator by the square root of x squared minus 9. So when I do that, I get x times the square root of x squared minus 9. In the denominator, I get x squared minus 9. And so by doing so, if I put negative 3 in now, I still get 0 in the denominator. So that didn't help. So that didn't work, and that didn't work. So then maybe we can just look at a graph. All right, it's kind of complicated. So we can look at a graph or a table or both. Okay, so in my calculator, I've already typed this in, I believe. Yeah, I've got x divided by the square root of x squared minus 9. I can look at a graph of that, and it looks like it stops, but it doesn't. This actually continues. This actually continues. If you weren't sure, though, because you can't really see much on this graph, you can always use a table. This is a table. I still have it on the ask function we talked about. I'm going to target 2. So now I can put in values that get closer and closer to negative 3 from the left. So I was making a table of values. We're getting closer and closer to negative 3 from the left. That means I need to start with values greater than negative 3. So maybe negative 3.1. Negative 3.01. Negative 3.001. Negative 3.0001, right? These are getting closer and closer to negative 3 from the left. So. I'm going to type those in. Negative 3.1. Negative 3.01. Negative 3.001. Negative 3.0001. And you can tell we just get to keep getting values that are smaller and smaller. So there's negative numbers. So we have about negative 4, negative 12, negative 39, negative 123. So they're, just not, they're not approaching a single point. They're not getting closer and closer to something. And if you look at the graph, as x approaches negative 3 from the left, it's going to continue to go down without bound. So because of that, this limit does not exist. And you can say that from the left, the function decreases without bound. It just keeps going, right? It doesn't stop. It doesn't approach a point. Okay? Again, try these other methods first, though. Don't make it all complicated if you could have directly substituted to begin with. All right. One more example. Find the limit. If it does not exist, explain why. So here we have a piecewise. We don't have to graph it, really. You should understand the pieces. Here it says, for all x is less than 2, here we have, for all x's, greater than or equal to 2. That's going to be very important. Okay? So let's do the first one. The limit as x approaches 2 from the right. Well, what values are to the right of 2? What values are greater than 2? Well, 3, 4, 5, 6. So for this limit, we're using the second part of the function because it says for values greater than or equal to 2. All right? So I am looking at those values if I'm coming from the right. So I'm going to start at directly substitute first and see what happens. We'll have to directly substitute into the right piece. So I have negative 2 squared plus 4 times 2 minus 2. Remember, if this negative up here is not in parentheses, then don't put it in parentheses. It's not supposed to be done that way. So I've got negative 4 plus 8 minus 2. Negative 4 plus 8 is 4, and 4 minus 2 is 2. So the limit as x approaches 2 from the right is 2. If you want to confirm that, we could graph it. 
I've got negative x squared plus 4x minus 2. I want to graph that. The parabola in my table. I'm just going to type in 2, and I get 2. So I've confirmed that. No problem. If you look at the graph, again, we're approaching 2 from the right. So here's 2. And so we're approaching it from this direction. So we're hitting that point right there. Okay? All right. On the second one, the limit as x approaches 2 from the left. Now I have a different piece. Values that are less than 2 or to the left of 2 are in the top part of this piecewise. So I can try to direct a substitute, but I have to use a different piece of the function. So I've got 4 minus 8 plus 6. Well, 4 minus 8 is negative 4. And negative 4 plus 6 is also 2. Again, we can try to confirm that in the calculator if you want to. I've got x squared minus 4x plus 6. You can graph that. We're approaching 2 from the left. So here's x equals 2, so we're approaching this direction. If you want to look at the table, it says 2, 2. That's not from last time. That's already recalculated it for me. Okay? Now, that means the limit as x approaches 2, the only place, these are both parabolas, all right? There's no gaps or holes. So the only place that this could not exist is at x equals 2. Because that's where your transitions are, right? One of the pieces stops, the other piece starts. Okay? So maybe they don't meet up. Maybe it's like this piecewise function where one piece goes this direction, one piece goes this direction, they don't meet up, okay? So that could be. So what you need to look at is look at the one sided limit. Are they the same? If so, that's your limit. So here, from the right it approaches 2, from the left it approaches 2, so that means as x approaches 2, the limit is 2. If, let's say, this one had been negative 7. It's not, but let's say this one was. Well, if from the right it approached 2, from the left it approached negative 7, then it doesn't approach the same place, so this limit would have not existed. So to be careful about those transition pieces, okay? If the one-sided limits both agree, then the limit is, should be the same. If they don't agree, then the limit does not exist for two-sided, all right? All right, so again, on the rest of your learning target four assignment, you're going to look at a graph, but you should always try direct substitution first, or then try an algebraic method.